Dominario's Judgment is brought to you by StarCityGames.com, where every week there's a new episode of this here podcast, but more importantly, there's a new weekly sale over at StarCityGames.com slash sale. And this week, until Sunday, October the 17th at 11.59pm Eastern Time, you can get 10% off all sealed products except for pre-orders. So you can get an Innistrad Midnight Hunt booster box, you can get Commander Decks from 2013, you can get an Arcane Rising booster box, and if you're thinking, hold up, that's a Flesh and Blood product, yeah, it is. I never said the sale was Images of Magic. Don't put words in my mouth. You can get 10% off those or any other sealed product all this week over at StarCityGames.com slash sale. What's up, everyone? Justin Parnell here, along with Ryan Overturf, and we want to tell you about the single best podcast on the SCG network. Well, obviously, Ryan, you're talking about the 540. Indeed I am, and that is the best podcast because we talk about the best format in the history of Magic. Uh, Cube Draft? Cube Draft. Every week we go over all things Cube. We're talking about in-depth reviews of brand new cards. The best ways to draft and think about arena and magic online cube formats as well as ways to play with your friends and ways to play with your enemies also some ways to make your friends into your enemies and cardboard takes of a variety of temperatures so if you're a fan of structured nonsense or if you hate it either way all the same check out the 540 every week wherever you find your podcasts and right here on starcitygames.com this week's episode of Dominari's Judgment is also brought to you by Coalesce Apparel, your first stop for Magic the Gathering inspired stylings. Visit coalesceapparel.shop to pick up a t-shirt inspired by fan favorite magic personalities, a hoodie from your favorite guild in the Ravnica University line, or just signal your intent to snap keep in the dark with an anti-mulligan mulligan club sticker. Want a splash of a commander deck? Check out the Keeping in 100 sticker line and see if your favorite commander shows up there. Whatever you order, use code SCG at checkout to save 10% on your purchase at coalesceapparel.shop. Coalesce Apparel. Nobody made what they wanted, so they made it themselves. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 27 of Dominario Judgment, a weekly modern podcast brought to you by StarCityGames.com. I'm Dom Harvey, I'm here with Ari Lax, and today we're going over one of the most fundamental topics in not just modern but all of magic, namely how to avoid uh, throwing the game away before it's even started here. Yeah, uh, this was kind of brought about because I started noticing that my mulligans across basically every deck I've been playing have kind of trended in one specific direction and in a direction that is not quite what I think people have, you know, built their modern heuristics on. So I figured it'd be a good time to sit down and chat some mulligans and chat about how you can play the format without throwing away games before they even start. Absolutely. Uh, but before we do that, as always, we want to go over a quick roundup of the results from the weekend here. So we'll start with the uh, Saturday challenge on Magic Online with uh, some familiar faces and some uh, familiar decks here, as well as a few twists that maybe are worth uh, getting into quickly. Yeah, so I let's just start with the twist because they are, it is literally at the top of the list. And that is uh, Currivore uh, winning with the, I think we highlighted this a couple weeks ago when there was that big blue white, you know, sweep. There was one, uh, one like, Yorian Restoration Angel Flicker style Azorius list in the in the top eight of that event. And here it is winning with a perfect 10-0 record in this challenge. Yeah, Curry for just completely running the tables here, uh, showing that they they take on blue white, uh, you know, 80 cards instead of 60 cards, and taking the deck in a certain direction, where sometimes Yorion is you're not making full use out of the companion itself. Uh, it's just a free card, which maybe leads to another free card or two. And the extra 20 cards that you're adding to the deck are just padding, essentially, there to get you up to that 80 card threshold. In this case, this is very much a Yorion deck. And you see a lot of these card choices, which uh, maybe would not uh, pass master even in a 80 card control deck under other circumstances, but which uh, are geared towards maximizing the value of that eventual Yorion. Yeah, I, I think the ones that are very stand out as like, I am a dedicated Yorian deck are Omen of the Sea and Wall of Omens. Just these cards that are generic cantrips that you are trying to put on the battlefield to Yorian away. Um, you'll notice, I guess we'll talk about this later, but with the green Yorian decks, Abundant Growth plays a very similar role. Yeah, just a 
a fairly innocuous uh, card smoothing tool in the early game, which is going to translate into another card later on. And you'll know that uh, Spreading Seas was not included on Ari's list there, even though uh, it certainly is included in this list with four copies in the main deck. That is just a very good card in modern right now. Uh, that is a card you want in your 60 card blue eye control decks if you can find the room for it. And so the fact that this deck gets to both justify playing four, co uh, four copies of that card in part because you have those extra slots to play with and then also eventually get another card out of what already is a very impressive deal in most cases. Uh, that to me is uh, one of the main reasons to embrace uh, this approach over some of the others. Yeah, I want you to like sit down and think as we go through this entire top eight about how bad getting Spreading Seas is for each of these decks, even if it is not enchanting an Urza Saga. And I think yeah. you'll find that it's like a big issue for the majority of decks in the format. Absolutely. And so the, the rest of this deck is mostly what you would expect. Uh, this is the uh, the main deck chalice uh, approach to control that has become the, the default at this point with the removal sweep reflecting that. So for Prismatic Ending, three Supreme Verdict, uh, for Solitude. And we do have a mini combo of sorts here with Solitude in our deck thanks to Restoration Angel, which uh, on turn four, you evoke Solitude, you blink it with Angel. Uh, even if the Solitude itself is a removal spell, you now have this reasonably well statted uh three four flying flash threat uh sticking around and we we mentioned when discussing how endurance is a surprisingly uh durable and flexible card a few weeks ago not just in the control modes which can't really kill it and now you have this instant speed threat which is applying pressure and you have all of the reactive tools here to help back that up but also against uh the uh dragon's rage channel index for example where endurance both uh after they're compelled to attack with their channeler, it eats their graveyard and then eats the channeler. Uh, Angel leaves their graveyard intact, but mostly does the same thing. Uh, just 3-4 being the perfect stat line to uh, trade off well with channeler there. And also just to apply pressure in general. You know, this one is not getting shot down by Lightning Bolt, for example. So it has to be Unholy Heat. Um, or a lot of the other common removal in the format just doesn't deal with this card in an efficient way. And Restoration Angel is not really an efficient card, so it doesn't have to be that efficient, and uh, certainly not by the standards of 2021 modern, but it's still, uh, if you can get even a small amount of value out of it, which you can hear with Wall of Omens and Solitude, and also Vendillion Cleek, uh, three copies of that in the main deck here too, it's just a very strong card, which is uh, something you're going to be very happy to see in a lot of spots here. Yeah, I also really want to highlight the fact that it provides this overwhelming endgame with Yorian, because you're flickering, you know, they just bounce back and forth forever. And at that point, all it really takes is one of your Omen of the Seas or Spreading Seas to just really bury your opponent in cards, because that's happening every single turn. Yeah, and Yorion itself, a 4-5 flyer, uh, leaving aside any of the, uh, the visions of blinking out uh, two Omen of the Seas and Spreading Seas and just uh, assembling the biggest and baddest Mole Drifter of all time, just the card Yorion itself is surprisingly hard to kill for a lot of decks, where... A 4-5 body gets around one copy of Fury, for example, which is uh, increasingly a mainstay in any red deck that has enough cards to pitch to it. Um, against the, uh, again, Unholy Heat will kill it, just like it kills everything else, but otherwise you're, you're demanding, let's say, Lightning Bolt and then maybe a second Lightning Bolt or a creature trading with it in combat or something. So even if the all of the other text on Yorion is getting you several cards worth of value back, often just the 4-5 body is doing that in addition or just killing them because they can't deal with it and so now you have a substantial clock uh, in your control deck yeah uh it's weird to say this after so long of living under the shadow of unholy heat but creature size is really starting to matter again uh, i mean i guess there you know there was this divide of like murktide regent and like things that weren't murktide regent and now there's a little more of a gradient i think it comes up a little more than you might expect in these control mirrors as well where they don't really want to be leaving in their Solitudes or their Supreme Verdicts, but if they don't, they're not going to Prismatic Ending your Yorion, right? And then uh, you do do not want to be bouncing that one with uh, Small Teferi or even tucking it with Big Teferi because unless you can counter it on the way back down, uh, you're just increasing the avalanche of card advantage that's going to bury you uh, in short order. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, you, you know, Solitude is a perfectly fine 3-2 flash. I would accept that in these control mirrors. I would as well, but I think forcing them to have an otherwise, uh, you know, conditional and or expensive card in a certain uh, window is, you know, when you're doing that for free on top of everything else you have going on, uh, that is going to give you an edge there. And looking at the sideboard, uh, we have uh, four Domains Veto, four Rest in Peace. So when we want to bring a certain hammer down on a given opponent, 
we have enough copies of that that even with 80 cards, uh, with some of that being card selection to make that back up, we can find that and resolve that consistently. And then against any of the decks where you just want as much stack-based interaction as possible, you can just turtle up behind for Veto, which is as hard a counter as a hard counter can be, uh, for Counterspell, for Archimedes Charm, free Force Negation. So if the game goes long, you are winning these counter wars. Uh, you just have the, the tools there to do that. And then uh, one sideboard slot, of course, is spoken for with the Orion. And then the interesting choices, which might be worth uh, unpacking here, are three Subtlety, uh, which we've seen in some previous iterations of this list, and then three Elspeth Sun's Nemesis. Uh, what, what do you think uh, that's geared towards? I was hoping you would answer that. Uh, okay. Uh, so it does say <laughs> minus three, you gain five life. So I'm just looking at jumping ahead to the second pl or third place list being burn. Uh, maybe this is a compromise of like a big threat for fair matchups that, you know, can grind out an opponent who tries to grind, but at the same time is something against burn that's going to gain life. And I guess against mill, I, it costs six to cast. You're not casting this from the graveyard. Yeah, I think it's more an attempt to consolidate your anti-burn cards and your, your grindy cards, whether it's for the DRC Ragavan decks or Control Mirrors potentially. I could see this uh, coming into play there. I think it's less reliable against the Ragavan decks because against most of those, you want rest in peace. And so you're getting maybe one casting out of this card, which uh, if that's all you can ever get, I don't think the rate is really there, especially for Martin. Um, but otherwise, I, I, I kind of see what's going on there but i wonder if there's a more efficient tool which like yeah okay your, your four mana card that gains life is good against burn in one sense if you have the time to get there but a, a two mana card that does even a fraction of that would probably be uh a better shot there yeah i yeah i i like you know i have questions about this card but i respect what it's trying to do yeah uh, some other small notes we see uh celestial colonnade as the creature land of choice over hall of storm giants I wonder if that's because with Vendillion Clique and Solitude and Restoration Angel, you get into more of these positions where you, you have this flash threat at the end of their turn, and then you can untap and immediately add to that pressure that suddenly appeared there with Activating Colonnade, whereas uh, Hall of Storm Giants takes a little more mana to get going. Uh, it's easier for them to block if that's something they're trying to do, and uh, the, the Vigilance with, of Colonnade helps you to attack and then maybe leverage your mana again in your main phase or hold up Counterspell, uh, that kind of thing. I think I would just point more towards the fact that this is an 80 card deck uh, with triple blue and double white requirements. And at that point, you're just kind of stretching for any kind of dual lands. And you may as well uh, utilize your creature land slots to also produce blue and white mana. I think that's really what it is. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But I think this list is, is very clean, very impressive. Uh, hard to argue with a, a, an undefeated run through an entire modern challenge. And it is really nice to... But when you see the same player popping up time and time again with different iterations of the same deck, uh, firstly, it's always rewarding, right? When you, you catch onto this idea which you think have merit uh, and you get to refine that over time and see the improvements in your results going along with that. And then also just to try and reverse engineer what those refinements are, like what their thought process must have been. So you go back a few months on uh, the MTG Goldfish page for, uh, for Curry 4, and you see a much more tap-out-centered, uh, more blink-heavy version of this deck with like Skycla uh, Skyclave Apparition in the main deck and uh, some more like big Sorcery Speed Haymakers. And then over time, this has been slimmed down to something which looks very much like your ordinary reactive blue-eyed control deck, but with some chalices and so on. But then also you have this uh, blink sub theme uh, rounding out the extra 20 cards there. Yeah, this is this is really an impressive like. So MTG Goldfish, you can look up like player results, just the listing from like literally the start of this year all the way through is just a string of results with Azorius Yori index. That's just all it is the entire way down. Uh, so that's like a pretty impressive amount of effort put into trying to make this deck work that it finally is. Mm -hmm. And that question that you pose of think about how spreading seeds would line up against each of these top eight decks, we can shortcut that a little bit because we have some duplicates here. So uh, two copies of Hammer in the top eight, uh, one in second place losing to Karivor in the finals in the hands of Darth Kid, uh, and then Wolfie98 here in fourth place. Uh, so the second place list, this is the 
uh, slight splash for thought seeds we've seen in the past. Uh, the one notable feature here being Hangabout Walker in the sideboard, which I imagine is for these uh, more grindy matchups where it's uh, a card that you can find with Ingenious Smith as a threat. You can recur it to some extent with Lurus, and uh, it's just a, a an annoying thing to have to grind through if your plan is to trade off one-for-one uh, -one removal spells. Yeah. Um, I might also just note that we're like working our way up to the full four Mishra's Bobble here with three in this list. I seem to recall like last week there being a lot of like two Mishra's Bobbles, you know, maybe one, but like just, you know, play, play more. It's got to be better than whatever the worst card in your deck is. Yeah, the question then becomes what is the worst card in your deck, which is uh, not easy to identify sometimes, but do you think the bauble is the kind of card where categorically you are making a mistake uh, if you're playing any number other than zero or four? No, I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, I just think in this case it probably is. Uh, it just... I think that without fetch lanes in the deck, it was easier to argue that all you were doing with the first copy was like free rolling an artifact that you could value off a saga for free that was also like adding to your metalcraft. It was like pretty, just pretty inoffensive to have as your last slot when previously the last slot in these decks was always really contentious. But like once you're going down this road of having another color and having marsh flats in your deck, I, you know, I'm fine just going up to the full four though. I guess in this list, it's kind of like the worst card would probably be the last Ingenious Smith or the Soul Guide Lantern, which is basically a fourth bauble. So, you know, whatever. Depending on who you ask, uh, the worst card is either the first Ingenious Smith or the fourth Ingenious Smith. And, uh, you know, second through fourth places are the other Ingenious Smiths, uh, however you rank them there. But uh, so, so that card is increasingly stock, if you want to call it that, but also the source of some controversy, uh, I think. If your format does move in this more granny direction, then I think Ingenious Smith maybe makes sense as that uh, final card to round it out. However, we do see, to uh, segue briefly into the Sunday challenge, uh, an Orzov hammer list with Dark Confident in that slot, which I think is a lot more fragile and a lot less reliable across the board. However, if what you're wanting to do is uh, bring the hammer down, so to speak, on these blue-white control decks, I think uh, Dark Confident does that better than maybe any other card. Yeah, I think Dark Confidant, the first time I saw it was around the time that Zoomer John started popping up. And I think that you very specifically want to avoid the lineup of their Renin Six and your Dark Confidant, or even just like their Lightning Bolt and your Dark Confidant. But as long as that's not happening, the card is pretty awesome. Yeah, Fire Ice can be kind of a catastrophe sometimes uh, as well. So the card is uh, high risk, certainly, but also fairly high reward. I think part of the adoption of Bauble is with a nod to Ingenious Smith, actually, because if you look at what that card does for the deck, uh, it can find you Colossus Hammer in spots where that is the one missing piece that you need to uh, to go berserk. But otherwise, it's just it's digging up an Ornithopter or a Memnite. Maybe it's finding Esper Sentinel, and hopefully this is a matchup where that card is good and it's still good on turn three or turn four. Uh, so if you don't have a high quantity of decent targets, then Ingenious Smith starts to look a lot less appealing. And Bauble turning your Ingenious Smith into Rogue Refiner, right? Uh, that is a, a decent upgrade there. Yeah. Um, and to go back, I just want to make a, a point. We talked about this Spreading Seas question, so I want to address it here. I am like actively sideboarding in my Spreading Seas against every single Hammer deck I can. It's in every deck that has Spreading Seas, it's one of the most important cards in the sideboard of games. You agree with that? Yeah, not just uh, the perfect lineup against Urza Saga, where you get to destroy that card outright and draw a card uh, for the low, low price of two mana, but uh, shutting off some of those Ink Moth Nexus lines, uh, even just tagging a, a Canopy Land sometimes, you know, a Silent Clearing, a Sunbay Canyon um, uh, can, can feel good if, if they're tabbed out. And then as these Hammer decks uh, add these cards like Mishra's Bauble, they're starting to trim on land. And so their actual uh, amount of color sources is becoming increasingly lower and that's why you see blood moon actually rising in stock i think against these hammer decks that are trying to support a splash where uh this list from darth kid in second place only four planes and you have four marsh rats to find them sure but there will be times where you if you land an early blood moon against hammer they just cannot cast up your still in. they cannot cast a lurus in any meaningful time frame yeah i mean early on in the hammer life cycle i think there was a general problem of trying to resolve how many non-colorless lands you play just because you do need those white lands, even not like Blood Moon 
ignore that card, ignore Spreading Seas. The deck is strained on white mana to begin with because you are playing, I guess in the second place list case, seven colorless lands, but like you're talking about 16 white sources for a deck trying to get double white on turn two. That, I don't know the exact math off the top of my head, but I feel like that's stretching it. Yeah, and that may be why you see uh, three Inkwath Nexus as an increasingly common number. And Iganjo Castle uh, seems to be a thing of the past. Uh, so pour one out uh, for uh, for the Iganjo Castle there. Uh, but moving down to the fourth place list, uh, Wolfie98 from Saturday. This is a Boros Hammer deck, and the red cards are Cyborg Werther. So yeah, sure, can get behind that. But then the two copies of Magnetic Theft in the main deck. And I kind of love this, actually, because I thought that the equip effects were the easiest thing to choke the hammer deck on for a while now and i seem to be the lone voice in the wilderness that still has any time for a core outfitter uh, but if you want uh, some kind of more efficient redundancy there magnetic theft offers that and this is just li- orders of magnitude above any other possible card in terms of how good it can be in the mirror um, and i think the mirror is going to be one of the most important matchups in modern Hammer's not going anywhere anytime soon. Two copies in this top eight alone. Uh, so yeah, if you want to pre-board for the mirror, uh, so to speak, then th- this may be the way to do it. Yeah. I do want to point out that neither of these decks is playing seal cleansing in the sideboard. And I found that card to be exceptional in the mirror. Um, it's just the kind of thing that forces the game into a grindy state where you will eventually find your Luris. And then from there, you're just recasting the seal and then everything goes poorly. Maybe wear tear is better, but I, I'm not even sure about that. Mm-hmm. We do have another duplicate here in this top eight, and that's Burn. And uh, it's a duplicate in the sense of there were two copies there. It's also a duplicate because the third place uh, finisher, Fracom, uh, their last four modern challenge results with Burn are winner, uh, oh, sorry, are three top eights and a ninth in their last four challenges. Uh, so that's a pretty obscene win rate, however, whatever that averages out to, um, and does suggest that. Even though Burn, I think, is a deck which you can uh, pick up and immediately pilot to something approaching reasonable capacity, actually getting the, the last inches out of that is very difficult and also uh, you're very rewarding if you, if you can complete that. Yeah, red spells are easy and hard at the same time, yet again. Uh, check back in 20 years, see if we say <laughs> the exact same thing. Yeah, after Modern Horizon 7, uh, our pens format once again. Burn and maybe Tron, but we'll see. We'll be the only uh, constant uh, still standing. Yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, maybe we'll see Affinity, but, you know, people, what, what can you do to change them? Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess, are we going to call the canister top aiding this uh, with another Yorian mid-range deck, a pseudo-duplicate, too? Because it, We, we I, could do. Yeah. yeah I, the, go ahead. Yeah, well, so my article this week that as of recording is not out, but as of you listening will be out, is talking about this resurgence of these. So Canister's playing the four color uh, ephemerate deck, but also, you know, I kind of linked the Azorius deck with that. And over the last few weeks, there's been what? We saw a challenge winner, right, with the four color mid range deck. We saw a challenge second. We saw this top eight with the updated list that I think is worth breaking down a bit. And then we saw the Azorius deck come back and win. And I'd have to look back and see when that other top eight was from Currivore. But there's been a lot of this sort of mid-range flicker strategy recently. Um, And it feels like it is capturing a lot of what is needed to beat Azorius while still presenting a lot of the same things that Azorius is actually presenting without kind of falling into the same traps of like dying to Cavernous Souls or whatever that the Azorius list have happened to them. Yeah, I think in the past that kind of uh, blink or ephemery theme has been seen as a kind of a gimmick, which, okay, is a, is a cool concept for a deck, but uh, you have to really commit to it and it's, it's not worth actually doing that. I think what we're seeing in practice is you can uh, lead into it enough to get uh, some value out of it without devoting your deck to playing like a bunch of soul herders or whatever. You, you can uh, meet them in the middle there and that's enough to automatically give you an edge in any kind of grindy matchup without uh taking your deck too far from it uh, from its intended purpose yeah i think i want to highlight a couple key additions to this four color deck that make it uh noticeably better than the four color piles from like three months ago that just got kicked out of the metagame by better four color piles uh i think that the inclusion of solitude and fury is a big thing 
Uh, this is sort of like a pseudo elementals deck just without Risen Reef and with Eternal Witness instead. Um, and then the other is Canister specifically adding Time Warp, which gives you multiple loops. So uh, the obvious one is Eternal Witness Ephemerate Time Warp. Like that's a classic that's been bouncing around for two years that has always been in these like janky Bant mid-range decks. But like here makes some sense because of Omnath giving you a lot more range. Um, but also it gives your Ren and Sixes a purpose. Uh, you can just like rush to an emblem and then go off with Time Warp. And that's something that this deck is sort of borrowing from the Indomitable Creativity decks without really committing to the whole Velomachus stuff. Yeah, that is a, a form of inevitability just by itself. And then uh, we mentioned Counterspell in the original version of this deck, not just as a generally good card in the format, which if you can cast and this deck kind of can cast it, but it's, it's not a guaranteed thing sometimes, uh, then... You, that card just gets an audition automatically, but also as a way to actually lock up the game once you have a Red and Six Emblem, once you have your uh, Eternal Witness Ephemerate Loops going and you're getting an additional card back on each cycle there, you can lock up the game uh, in that like 1990s Forbid style with uh, Candle Spell, or you can just take every turn for the remainder of the game with Time Warp. And in a deck which otherwise wants to be very proactive and has these quite specific uh, mana requirements that has to juggle. Uh, I think Time Warp does that job a lot better. It also happens to be another very good uh, five mana mana sync for your Omnath. So when you get to curve Omnath into Fetchland, uh, you find a blue source and now you have three blue blue and you, you immediately get to Time Warp. You're getting another round of triggers with your Omnath, maybe the first attack with your Omnath. You can follow up with something else. You have time to pick up your Yorion. And at that point, it's so hard for the opponent to I mean, even if they can answer Omnath, which they kind of have to do, it's so hard for them to actually turn that around and get back in the game past that point. Yeah. Uh, these decks are just impressive. Expect to see more. Uh, please play more lands or Abundant Harvest. Uh, Canister has upped it to 28 and 1 Abundant Harvest. Uh, that is probably equivalent to a 22 land 60 card deck. So may maybe just like one more. Can we just get one more? And then I'll... Yeah. I'll Maybe it, it stop feels, saying things. It feels so light. And I, I get the idea behind a button harvest where in theory you get to up your land count while not flooding as much in the late game because that is an issue which you have when uh, you have a bunch of abundant growths and corrals and so on is that uh, the, the ratio of lands to spells in your deck eventually converges on the point where you're not actually drawing as much action as you would want to be. And then Renin 6 kind of contributes to that problem sometimes because you draw Renin 6 on turn 5, and it's just getting you even more land. Uh, so I get the idea behind that card, but I don't know how much of a land you can actually counter at here, uh, counter as here, because there will be turns where you need to do things like uh, spend all your mana this turn for Renin 6, and then next turn for to Fairy, or whatever. Or uh, uh, on this specific turn, you're going to do this, and then use Winners to pick up your card, and then you want to leave Ephemerate open, and just finding that spot to... Have a spare mana and have it be specifically a green mana is, is not trivial. So uh, you, you can get into some awkward situations with that card, which I think is why, you know, going back to when that card was first previewed as, I think, literally our first taste of uh, Modern Horizons 2, uh, we expected this card, I think, to be more popular than it has been. And I think that's because, you know, if you have to operate on that hyper-efficient uh, mana timeline, sometimes just finding a good spot for this card is easier said than done. I think you have a little more wiggle room here with your Solitudes and Furies taking up a lot of your early interaction. But yeah, there, there is a point where you will run into your cap of abundant cards uh, taking up mana slots, you know, growth and harvest along the curve. Yeah, and then the rest of this top eight, we have Matea Ritzi in eighth with a fairly stock looking list here of Is It Murktide? So very accomplished player on stock list of, the, of one of the better decks. Uh, no, no surprise, nothing too much to comment upon. And then uh, the final member here is Pun Then Wine in sixth place on Amulet Titan with Khan the Great Creator, which, again, this is someone who you go on their MTG Goldfish page, you find just obscenely, absurdly successful results consistently with basically this exact build of the deck stretching back uh, for many, many months now. And uh, he is uh, perhaps most notoriously known as... Uh, the originator of the, you know, Amulet has been tier one through every broken iteration of modern uh, comment, which is easy to uh, to poke fun at. But when you've had the 
level of consistency that he has had with this archetype, you you can't fault someone for getting into that mindset uh, quite as much. It, it's better than the no bad matchups uh, line. <laughs> so, you know, but talking about Amulet, maybe let's segue to a different tournament. It, I heard you won something this weekend. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure exactly what it is that I won. I'm told it's some like very valuable collector's item. But yeah, my first taste of paper magic in 18 months. So that by itself uh, was always going to drag me out of the house and always going to be very uh, rewarding and, and worth the trip. But uh, hey, taking home first place in your first tournament in that long, uh, it's good to be back. You know, <laughs> some, some things never change. Are you going to retire now? Do I need to find a replacement host? Was that just the... <laughs> It's all downhill from here. Yeah. Uh, I think if I retired, then we'd have to change like the name of the podcast and that might be a whole uh, ordeal here. Go- gotta find like a-, a good pun that works with, I don't know, Ross or whoever else would be drafted in uh, instead of me. But yeah, I think Amulet, it's, it's definitely not in the no bad matchups phase, which was always kind of an exaggeration, but it was semi-true in like the Once Upon a Time era. I don't think it's in the no good matchups phase, which has seemed like it has been in for the past few weeks. I think it is solidly like a C tier deck with ambitions of being a B uh, B tier deck once again. And uh, that initial week one hype after MH2, where uh, Yokanasa himself was top eighting challenges every week, it seemed like with different builds of the deck and so on. I don't think we're going back to those days, but the deck did feel legitimately impressive again. And, uh, you know, it is... For any small local tournament, there's always a bit of a warped metagame and you're not getting a truly representative slice of what's going on. But uh, the deck definitely did feel like, you know, it's fundamentally powerful. And even in the matchups where you're not favored on uh, on, on the fundamentals, you can just plow through them with the, the nut draws, which are increasingly common now, thanks to Urza Saga. Yeah, I, I've had issues with this deck against like Force of Vigor in the past. But I don't think that that's like the biggest deal. You have ways around that if you just like sideboard smartly with amulets and dryads, I think might be part of it. I think my opponents maybe aren't cutting dryad enough is, is maybe the thing that I should think about. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's good. Uh, it's powerful. It loses to a lot of specific things. But right now we might be at a bit of a low point for Blood Moon and Unholy Heat. So it's kind of okay. Yeah, I think if I was wanting to commit to this for a uh, a more open tournament, I would pay careful attention to recent Murtide lists and the split that they have of Alpine Moon versus Blood Moon, for example, um, where you look at the the list that Mattia Rizzi finished in eighth place with, zero Blood Moons in the 75. Uh, we've got two Alpine Moons in the sideboard, and weirdly enough, that card is better against your best draws than Blood Moon often is some of the time. Um, I had a game in, in the tournament where I had essentially everything I could ask for and was going to win the game even against an opposing Blood Moon, but Alpine Moon stranding my Urza Saga uh, just KO'd me on the spot effectively. And uh, stuff like that can come up sometimes, but for the most part, you would gladly take that trade of uh, if all the Blood Moons in the tournament would become Alpine Moons instead, uh, you know, Cascade Restrictions uh, depending, uh, you would take that. And so... Uh, the Motown matchup is always going to be tough. Uh, no matter what your configuration would not want to be paired against someone who knows that deck well and knows the matchup well. Um, but if you can get that to be possible, then uh, the other stuff starts to look pretty good because these are uh, value ephemerate piles. I think you're, you're very well set up against those. I think the hammer matchup is you're behind, but I think it's one of those spots where you'd rather be the deck on the play um, than get your choice of deck, if that makes sense. And then if Burn is going to be a big deal, then Amulet traditionally has just uh, clowned on that matchup. And that deck has not really got any faster. Uh, as we mentioned, this is basically the 2018 version of Burn carried forward into the modern day. Um, and the Amulet deck has got a lot faster since then. So um, if you expect a lot of slow-ish linear decks, then I, I think the deck actually might be well positioned again. Uh, that all sounds like a pretty good pitch for the deck. I... We'll probably dabble with things that are not Amulet just because I, I don't know. I've done the Amulet thing. If it's not like going to be the absolute best thing, I don't feel like going back. But I respect the like desire for the Amulet aficionados to play their deck and feel good about it again. So good to hear that it is doing some good work. 
Yeah, and uh, I split the finals of that tournament with uh, Zach Ryle, aka Mana Symbol, who uh, people will remember as uh, one of the main progenitors of the four color creativity deck. Uh, he was piloting that deck once again, seemed to be running very well for him uh, over the weekend, and often found streaming a bunch of other wacky decks in the format as well. So I uh, would recommend uh, checking his stream out uh, if you like just nonsense of the week, and also if you want. Uh, some you know good detailed guides to the creativity deck which as we mentioned last week i think is a if amulet is c tier aspiring to be b tier i would say creativity is b tier kind of at risk of slipping down but probably holding its ground for the time being interesting okay yeah that's a reasonable assessment of it i i'm a bit lower on it than other people are probably but i respect that again I think the four color decks in general have the ability to push a bit on like the control decks just because of their position. I mean, this was something we saw from Wafo one week where he showed up and won with, you know, the four color, you know, Velimachus deck after beating everyone up with Azorius. So I expect that that is like a consistent trend. Um, yeah, do we uh, nothing. Talk about... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, do we want to talk about Sunday or are we good talking about uh, some four color stuff still? Let's uh, talk about exactly ninth place because uh, Sodek here fighting the good fight with the Belter deck, which uh, I know you've said your piece about. Uh, I think everything that needs to be said about that deck has been said, mostly by Sodek, who uh, has gone into a lot of detail there. So if if you're someone who plays one way and uh, you want to be playing linear combo of some kind, then uh, I, I guess you can be motivated by by that success. But for the most part, uh, scanning the rest of these results, uh, nothing too remarkable. So we'll, we'll quickly scan over. Sunday's results uh, to uh, Demonic Tutors, uh, Ed D'Amico, uh, who has been popping up in these top eights time and time again with uh, Golgari Ogmoth, uh, taking the whole thing down uh, this time uh, earlier today. So uh, that deck in the hands of that player, putting up consistent success. And uh, as I said before, I, I want this deck to be better than it always performs in my hands. Um, but it, seemingly if it's in the right hands, then uh, the, the, the sky's the limit here. Well, the good news is my understanding is that this entire event is on a Twitch VOD. So I intend to watch that at like two and a half speed over the next week and do all the research. And by that, I mean, someone else did it all for me. Yeah. And when you say two and a half speed, you might be thinking, well, doesn't Twitch cap you at uh, 2.x? No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> there are some tricks here, which if, if you really want to uh, maximize the efficiency of your time, then you can, uh, you can get to the next level there. Yeah, yeah, you can, uh, you got to open up the dev tools, click the right buttons, and all of a sudden you're at super speed. Yeah, you uh, inspect some elements and then uh, you're off to the races there. Uh, so the rest of the top eight, we have uh, two copies of the uh, the 60 card blue-white Travis control deck. One, uh, one copy, of course, in the hands of uh, Guillaume Rafa Tapper, because w why not? Um, a copy of uh, Demir Mill uh, in the semifinals here, black-white hammer deck. Uh, and then two copies of Jun Saga, including... Javier Dominguez. Uh, anyone who has played enough Magic Online will know the username uh, Thalai uh, and will have probably lost that username uh, several times. And now that uh, organized play, competitive Magic is officially dead, uh, we've got some world champions and some uh, NPL members uh, in the, the Magic Online trenches uh, once again. So uh, those events are going to get uh, even harder uh, g going forward from now. Yeah, I mean, you know, the... The field was pretty impressive before, like there were already MPL members and, you know, pro tour champions, but maybe a little bit more. I I think that this is a format where uh, play skill is important, but like immersing yourself in the format is equally important. So I, I think the field is a little more even than, you know, some other format that is faster moving like standard or maybe not faster moving, but like more turbulent. Yeah, and we are seeing uh, a lot of elite players dabble in the format once again. So Brad Nelson, for example, has been tweeting out, you know, I've got the, the Invitational coming up in a few weeks and I need to find a modern deck for that. What should I be playing? And, you know, I'm sure uh, John Saga will be on his list there. And even though Brad has not played modern in a while and won't be familiar with the ins and outs of this exact deck list, Brad has played a, a, a fair amount of John in his time, I think it's fair to say. And so a lot of that will carry over and... Uh, so, yeah, I think a lot of those people will be getting up to speed fairly quickly here. Yeah, I mean, Brad has been John Guy for, I mean, how long has John Guy been a thing? Long enough? Longer than it should have been. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, even if you are a, a John Boomer, you can become a John Zoomer with not too much 
uh, work, I think. So that's going to do it for the uh, the challenge results for the weekend. Anything else to touch on before we dive into uh, Mulligans in Martin? No, I think that's about it. Uh, actually, no, I do want to shout out one other thing that I had appended at the end here and forgot about. Uh, there were multiple prelim foros with the updated version of Esper Reanimator from last weekend's challenge, including uh, me guesting on Jarvis U's stream and uh, explaining to him how to cast Counterspell and Thoughtseize, apparently. Uh, so if you haven't seen that, I, I think we mentioned it last week briefly or more than briefly, but this is the like, Mole Drifters, but also unmarked Grave List uh, and Reanimator is great. Uh, I think the deck's continued success is not shocking to me. It's very powerful. Casting Counterspell, backing up a powerful threat is like one of the best things you can do in the format. And uh, this is one of the better ways to do that. So don't sleep on that deck. Uh, I would play with and against it and I would just have some respect for our kind of cruelty coming out of the graveyard. Absolutely. So uh, with that endorsement in the books, there are some other endorsements uh, that we need to get you through before we take you to our main segment here. So stick with us. We'll be back in, in just a second. If you are looking to sell your Magic the Gathering cards, it's never been easier than selling to StarCityGames.com. With a 30% store credit trading bonus and the fastest turnaround time in the industry, there's no reason to sell to anyone else. Visit StarCityGames.com slash sell that's S-E-L-L -L for details on all four of our great ways to turn your cards into cash or credit. Check out our buy list to sell specific cards. Ship your cards to us for an offer with our Ship and Sell program. Schedule an appointment with us at Star City Comics and Games in Roanoke, Virginia for the classic experience of selling to a person. Or if you are a store or have over 500,000 cards to sell to us, we can come to you. Visit StarCityGames.com sell for more details on your preferred way to sell your cards and let us make it the easiest and best experience selling Magic the Gathering cards that you have ever had. All right, let's dive into our main topic here, which is uh, Mulligans in Modern. And uh, specifically, we're talking about uh, the London Mulligan in post-Modern Horizons to Modern. And I think both of those qualifications are essential to uh, understanding this topic. Yeah, so let's talk a bit about the London Mulligan because I think that there's also like a huge distinction to be drawn between the London Mulligan in like, Modern Horizons 1 Modern and the London Mulligan now. But let's just start with the London Mulligan in general, because that is the biggest change to the game in a long time. Yeah, and before that, uh, when we had the change to the Vancouver Mulligan rule in uh, 2015, that mostly passed without comment, I think. And that was almost universally hailed as a, a good change uh, for every format. But I don't think there was much theoretical discussion done of how does this actually affect things? Uh, because I, th I think it was assumed that uh, it makes decks more consistent across the board, at least a few are non-games and, and stuff like that. But in terms of disparate impact on different decks across different formats, it seemed like not much of that analysis uh, really took place at that point. I think that there was this generalized, like, if you make the mulligan rule better, it will benefit combo decks going on. But no one was really thinking that it would drastically change that anywhere just kind of like a hey if you start seeing combo decks win like three percent more than they used to maybe take a look at the mulligan rule uh and then we just kind of threw that out and decided to london it up am i uh am i misrepresenting you in thinking you were one of the few people who were sounding the alarm about the vancouver mulligan and its potential impact on modern at the time uh i don't think i was alarmist at all i think that that was the kind of thing where i just kind of flagged it like i said it was kind of like a you know take note but the london mall i it, since day one i've basically been like this is <laughs> going to cause issues in a lot of ways uh and it really has but it is when it works out it is really nice it just has a tendency to fail yeah I, how much of uh impression of it do you think is anchored by the state of the format that it was being introduced into where uh you had uh tron as this uh ever-present feature of the format which suddenly ballooned into being this boogeyman with the london mulligan as potentially the the biggest beneficiary of that uh you had dredge which was already uh getting some whispers about faithless losing being in the band conversation along with is a phoenix and uh dredge supposedly was going to be one of the the big gainers here as well and any of the various lineage decks, which uh, 
it seems like are always just hovering underneath the surface, waiting for that one piece to to boost them up into best deck territory. Uh, you know, KCI had just been banned at, at this point, so we were free from that menace, but surely there was going to be something else uh, uh, coming down the pipeline. And so with all of those fears as a backdrop for this, it seemed like the natural reaction to the London Mulligan is, oh God, the the things which modern is often stereotyped as being, you know, just uh, two ships passing in the night, so on and so forth. It feels like this can only amplify that. Well, yeah, I think some of it was that context. And then some of it was the following context where Hogak happened. Or the next <laughs> yes. context where like Standard had uh, Oko plus Gilded Goose plus Once Upon a Time. Or the next context where Standard had Fires of Invention. Or the next context where just like you had open deck list events where you could play uh, Wilderness Reclamation against everybody and just like mulligan to interaction against aggro or mulligan to the good hands of the mirror. Just like it caused the London mulligan has created. I am not saying that like Oko would not be banned, but like it did not help. It did not help at all in any of those cases. And yeah, it, it makes anything that is kind of bad a lot worse. So going into Pro Tour London, uh, Pro Tour War of the Spark, during that testing process, how much of that discussion centered around these are the decks that gain the most or lose the most from the change of this mulligan rule? Uh, it was probably the focal point. I think that there was a lot of... I know that we put a lot of effort into Dredge and the discovery of how the matches with dredge started working under the London Mulligan was an immediate turnoff to the mechanic. Uh, basically every single dredge hand in game one was early dredge into secondary dredge. And every sideboarded game was like guaranteed at least a dredge enabler plus a piece of interaction, like an anti interaction piece. And then, like, the other side was forced to mulligan. It was just bad. It was just a lot of games that were spending. Uh, and, you know, I think that this is something that the the rule has existed in such a long time frame where it was not in paper that people forgot. But the creating a format where mulligans to five occur in, like, a decent chunk of games, there's a lot of load time wasted on shuffling. Like, you talk about, like, if you go from an average of like two mulligans a match, which is probably like three minutes of time. So like what, 5% of a match clock wasted to like six or seven, like you are talking about like 10 or more percent of a match being spent on mulligans because of this rule. And that is, that's a pretty big pain point. Uh, and I think that that is something that is ignored because it does not have direct game balance impacts, but like, when you sit down and play the matches, there like if you're playing Tron, like there is so much time wasted on the London Mulligan that it's just not even funny. I think the the hope in terms of how the impact of this might be kept in check was, all right, your dredge deck now gets its uh, most broken starts more consistently, but on the other side of things, your opponent now finds their their cyborg hate piece, their lead under the void, or their rest in peace with. Uh, an equal amount of additional consistency, and so that all kind of balances out in the wash. I I get the sense that never really ended up in practice at any point. Uh, no, it did. It just created very uh unfun games in a lot of ways. Like you would, your dredge player like would know that they're playing against hate every game. The other player would be forced to mulligan into the hate. You'd spend like seven minutes of everyone shuffling and then like flop your hands on the table and be like, I had two ley lines, it's over. Or like, here's one ley line. I hope everything falls apart and it doesn't, and then you die. Yeah, we almost got a, a weird example of A versus B testing with the London Mulligan uh, as it pertained to Hogak, where uh, after Pro Tour War the Spark, we then, we don't get the immediate adoption of the, the London Mulligan. And so uh, uh, Modern Horizons 1, Here's the format with the bombshell that uh, that set was intended to have uh, under what at first was going to be the old mulligan system. Uh, and so shortly thereafter, uh, in the second Hogag format, where we, we banned Rich from Below and somehow the deck almost gets better in a way, um, we then, after a few tournaments of that, adopt the London Mulligan 
And now that rides out the rest of the Hogak era. And so you can kind of line up these different phases of MH1 gets printed, Hogak takes over, then the Hogak deck has to rebuild itself, then the London Mulligan comes in, and then those two things are going on in parallel. And you can compare those side by side to see just how more or less broken the deck was under each one of those uh, constraints. Uh, it was just broken the whole time. I don't think there's well, well, a good sure, comparison but <laughs> there. But yes, I agree that there was a great time for that A versus B testing to occur. It just happened that like, it was just always broken. And so in a, at a point where once you remove the Hogak Menace where, and maybe uh, an entire pillar of the format as collateral damage uh, for that, we then get into this rhythm of sets where I think you could locate the start at War of the Spark, maybe it's Modern Horizons, wherever. But from that point on, of course, Throne of Eldraine really kicks us into Overdrive as well. The best cards are just so good that uh, you just want to maximize your access to them as consistently as possible. And now you have a new mulligan mechanic, which essentially lets you do that without making any additional sacrifices uh, elsewhere. Yeah, I think that we can kind of wash over that whole era because it has been erased from history. Um, and just start back up at about, like, Kaldheim and the Cascade rule change. Okay, uh, where would you uh, take it from there? I think that that, uh, maybe, yeah, Kaldheim, the Cascade rules change, and the prevalence of Skyclave Apparition. And I think also the removal of uh, the Balustrade Spy deck. Well, specifically the removal of Simeon Spear Guide, which in turn removes uh, Balustrade Spy from the format, sort of indirectly. As the point where, like, the London Mulligan ceased to be this weapon for making a, like, hyper-linear deck go as fast as it can, and more this thing that, like, sculpted games the way it was kind of intended to be. And I mentioned Skyclave Apparition only because it feels like Modern Horizons 2 has created a metagame in Modern where the London Mulligan is not causing problems and actively used a lot uh, and that has to do with the answers that have been pushed into the format as opposed to any of the threats yeah and the threats are all so good and so efficient that there's a lot of pressure to ideally have those answers in your opening hand so that you have immediate access to them you're not uh, messing around trying to use cantrips and so on to find the answers that you need and you're willing to you know have a six card hand that has an immediate answer to a Ragavan or a Murtide region or some other threat that can very quickly snowball out of control rather than a, a, a passable seven card hand, but which is just lines up poorly against uh, one of those likely threats that the opponent can uh, present. Yeah, and I think that there's just like the... Br All the modern decks, so every modern deck basically has come around to incorporating some form of broad interaction whereas before like you had this format where ironworks played engineered explosives because that was an artifact and it could incidentally get away with it or like people played spell queller because they were playing spirits um you wouldn't see people just like playing path to exile because their linear deck wanted path to exile like they had to really mean it if that was happening maybe lightning bolt but like that was it and even then there was some debate now it's just like, yep, okay, I built a deck and there's four prismatic endings in my, like, pseudo combo deck. Um, and that, like, synergy interaction thing is kind of, like, a nice-to-have thing that happens when you're like, oh, Solitude plus Risen Reef is a thing. And that kind of brings me to this chicken and egg question. Um, are people playing this interaction because Raghavan is so good or, like, all these other threats? Or are they just playing the interaction because it's generically good and the fact that it lines up against Raghavan is like an incidental? I think that's that's both part of it. Uh, or, or hold on, I think both of that or both parts of that are true. There we go. Uh, but on top of that, all the, the things which those answers might have blind spots against just don't really exist in the same way, right? So the, the linear combo deck where Prismatic Ending might not actually have a good target because everything that matters is happening uh on the stack that just doesn't really exist in the current iteration of modern despite so Dex's best efforts uh, for uh the time being here and so those versatile answers they're versatile against the things that answers usually are good against they're maybe not as narrow as something like a path to exile um 
but also the things which even those broad answers might normally miss are just absent from the format. And so th that still gives you an opportunity to uh, kind of bob and weave around that, uh, so to speak, where if you think the format is becoming overly reliant on cards like Prismatic Ending as they go to uh, interactive uh, cards, if you can find stuff which maybe because it has like an artificially high mana cost, it's harder to prismatic ending or something which is mostly not taking place on the battlefield and so ending can't interact with it to begin with, um, then you can find ways to exploit uh, the way that removal is meant to line up. Uh, still, I think even though doing that through conventional means is more difficult. Yeah, and I think that it's worth noting that a lot of the cards people are playing are just like inherently, they're not playing them because they're good against removal, but they're pretty inherently good against removal. Like Dashing Raghavan, for example, is one example. Or just like even picking up a couple of rails off your Dragon's Raid Channeler, uh, you don't really get too far by trading everything. You just like don't get mushed by the other version of the card where it just goes off and does everything you want it to. Yeah, I think specifically Prismatic Ending is a really interesting example to highlight here because you can imagine an iteration of Modern where, let's say, a bunch of the, the broken one-drops and uh, cheap threats don't get printed. And so we have Ending as this uh, hyper-flexible answer, but it's mostly also trying to deal with two drops and three drops and cards like Mantis Rider still exist and, and so on and so forth. And in that context... The card looks less impressive because it's only ever it's never trading up on mana in the same way, right? Whereas if uh, all the threats cost one, then there's really no difference between prismatic ending with x equals zero to kill a ragavan versus lightning bolt killing the same ragavan the way there would be with fatal push on mantis rider versus uh, prismatic ending on mantis rider, for example. Yeah, and. I think talking about the the interaction here, like it is great to have these cards in your deck, but I think that like kind of brings up my one overarching rule about how I've begun mulliganing in modern because all these decks look very similar, right? They're some stack of very good threats, some to like more a bit more than some pretty good answers. But I am like always trying to avoid keeping hands that are purely reactive. Like I need to have a hand that is if it's reactive, it's got to be like, OK, that is supporting some threat, some action I'm taking to progress the game. And is that a dilemma more acute than uh, with some decks and with others uh, under, you know, so I know you've been playing a lot of uh, Living End, for example, and the other Cascade decks. Those operate under a very, I would say, unique mulligan heuristic, which we'll unpack in a little bit. Um, a deck like Hammer Time, for example can play a fair game, but you're, you're still trying to get A plus B in, in a certain uh, time frame. And then you have the decks like uh, Is It Murktide, uh, the John Saga, stuff like that, where these fit the typical model for, uh, you know, a bunch of good threats, a bunch of good answers. Um, and so maybe the, that, that's where there might be this biggest mismatch between the mulligan heuristic you use as a John player back in 2018 and the mulligan heuristic that you need as a John Saga player here in 2021. Yeah, I think that the John and Is It decks are the decks most prone to having this issue. But like Team or Crash Gade can very easily fall into the same issue where like you have hands of castable spells that aren't doing enough. Um, I'm trying to think what the other decks that this is really like. Those are decks that I know off the top of my head that this has become an issue with that I have really tried to avoid uh, keeping those hands with. But like even something like Azorius Control, if my hand was all one for one answers, I might be a little skeptical of it. Uh, five color elementals like that is another deck that is running into that same kind of dilemma where like if my hand is like I'm going to fury your thing and solitude your thing, I really, really want to have an ephemerate to turn that into something proactive. Yeah, the, the decks that rely on those uh, pitch elementals as most of their early interaction, I think have to care about card quantity as well as card quantity in a way that can uh, lead to some uh, tough decisions sometimes where I've had games as Elementals, for example, where, you know, my opening seven just doesn't have much going for it. I go down to six and I'm able to successfully pull off uh, Evoke Fury or Evoke Solitude into Ephemerate and we've traded off a bunch of resources, but now I just have literally nothing left. And this is in a deck which wants to get to three lands for Risen Reef and then wants to be 
casting Omnath and ideally hard casting his five drops past a certain point. And so if your deck is structured in such a way where you have to throw these cards away early and you need specific cards to keep up and so you're kind of priced into mulliganing at a certain point, then you need ways to, to recoup those cards or you just don't have anything left over. And I think that just, I think that is part of why we see more and more more drifters in these linear decks, not just Elementals, but also Reanimator, for example, which has kind of the same issue uh, going on. And it is weird to think that there was no place for more drifter in modern as of 2016, 2017, when the format seemed much more forgiving. And yet now where everything is hyper efficient and so on, at that point, you kind of just want a divination at a certain point. Yeah, it's weird. Mole Drifter existing in the format is weird, even if I know why it's there. Um, so you pointed out any deck with incarnations as something that's going to mulligan a little worse than the other decks and possibly something where you can start. I don't really want to violate the purely reactive hands thing, but you might want to keep hands that like look a little more marginal, even if like they're, as long as they're functional. Um, I think that this kind of layers on the fact that I think a lot of the four color decks just generally have land count issues um, where they're like trying to cast expensive spells but not flood out and that makes them worse at mulliganing. They also have this issue where like they are trying to get to a slightly bigger game plan um, but every time they trade off like a prismatic ending early that is a card that is not progressing them to that game plan directly by like producing a resource. Uh, so once you start mulliganing to six, you kind of like just have to accept some amount of like, well, if they have two Rockavons, this hand's dead and that's my life. So uh, I would. In that case, it's a bit more of like I have mulliganed and like you're going to mulligan a bad hand, but like don't try to hedge your bets too hard on your smaller hands and just try to make a functional hand. And I think that in general, you should really think about how much mana your deck needs when you're making those second, like the the six card mulligan decisions about whether you're gonna, you know, risk drawing a land or whether, or risk bottoming a land or whether you're just gonna like bin a spell and if your opponent has all the stuff, you lose the game. Yeah, I think being able to build your deck in such a way that it does mulligan aggressively well, that is a big appeal to a deck. And uh, that is a big point of comparative advantage uh, for some of these hyper low curve efficient decks versus uh, stuff like, uh, you know, Elementals uh, is the example we're using here, but even some of the control decks where you are still hewing to that game plan of I need to hit my land drops and cast my spells, and the entire can see here is I am casting more expensive, more high impact spells, and those will win me the game if I can delay the game to that point. Um, and th this current crop of Azorius control decks, you can get some free wins off Trance of the Void and stuff like that, and so if you know your opponent is very weak to Chalice, if you're playing against a Cascade deck, for example, maybe you're willing to ship back an average looking seven just in, in the hunt for a Chalice or uh, you know, Teferi Time Raveler or some card like that. Um, but we kind of saw that principle come up for the first time actually at Pro Tour World of the Spark. And this was at a point before the control decks gained a bunch of these uh, universally good tools in the Modern Horizon sets and the overall card quality was still uh, very low. Where in that tournament, you saw a lot of quite successful control decks main decking Rest in Peace, main decking a lot of these fairly conditional cards where the, the new London Mulligan in conjunction with open deck list meant that that traditional control problem of you draw your Supreme Verdict in the control mirror or you, you draw your, you know, the, the other half of that uh, against the other half of the format, that problem just didn't really occur in the same context. And you also needed to line up your answers in the exact right way to have an edge against uh, the field at large. So yeah, if you got paired against Dredge, you needed Rest in Peace to have a chance, you could mulligan aggressively for Rest in Peace. And if you saw from your opponent's deck list, you were paired against humans, well, you, you go to six and that Rest in Peace is staring back at you. There's no ambiguity over whether you should keep that or not. You just get to send it back and hope that the rest of your cards do their job properly. Yeah, I would. I think that you can summarize some of this as like, I mentioned don't keep reactive hands. Lock pieces are not reactive. So even if you are, you know, you mentioned this open deckless thing where everything's perfect, even in the imperfect information world of Magic Online, you can kind of feel pretty comfortable just like if you're looking at an Azorius control hand and it's got like a rest in peace and then like take some other game actions, maybe as a little controlly, like 
yeah, just some percentage of the time that rest in peace is going to end the game. And therefore that hand is pretty good. It's the same thing as like some percentage of the time that turn one Raghavan will kill your opponent. Sometimes it'll trade for a removal spell, but like whatever, you're moving along with your life. Yeah, and, and that's one aspect of uh, mulligans in modern as it stands right now that we, we should touch on, I think, is in a context where you don't have open deck lists, but you do have some information in the form of a companion being revealed, what does that tell you? And what assumptions should you be willing to make based on that? Okay. Uh, so the Luris thing. Um, uh, so Kahira is kind of weird. Uh, if my opponent flips a Kahira, I think that that, I mean, the fact that it cues for Elementals or Azori's control, there's a bit of a spread there, but your efficient removal is not going to be super important. If your opponent flips a Luris, throw this entire rule about reactive hands out the window. You, like, you can... <laughs> If you have four removal spells versus a Luris deck, you might lose the game if you don't draw out of it and do anything. But like, realistically, every single Luris deck is going to start pressuring you on turn one with threats. You're going to have to kill their Luris. And like the worst case scenario is like, why would you mulligan your reactive hand against like Zoomer Jund, which is just going to Inquisition you? The rule of like not getting inquisitioned or thought seized and like on a mulligan, like that still applies in that case. So I think that once your opponent reveals Luris, you should be kind of reversing it where unless you're like in a very proactive stance, taking a very proactive plan, you should not be keeping a hand that can't be reactive because they will play a one mana threat of some kind, whether that is Esper Sentinel from the Pure Steel deck whether it's Raghavan from every other Luris deck. Uh, and from there, like, you have to be able to stop them and have to be able to get to the rest of the game. Yeah, the, the bind that the Luris decks put you in is you need removal to deal with their first wave. And you know that a deck that can support Luris is going to have a lot of cheap threats. Um, and then if it's, you know, Hammer, for example, they're going to have ways to present a very fast potential kill. Uh, if it's some of the, the more grindy lure stacks and they're going to have ways to uh, fight through at least one removal spell so you need several to get the job done but that only gets you so far and past that point you need to be able to deal with the, uh, the cards that can still give them an advantage heading into the mid game like lures which you know is there and which you know you have to deal with and the threat of that is always looming over the game but if you keep a hand of just removal spells against hammer for example alright you're, you're going to interfere with uh, their early kills and if they commit all of their resources to going for the kill as fast as possible then maybe you get the blow out there and uh, nothing else is going to matter but that deck is remarkably adept at grinding and your hand of uh, lightning bolts and thorsies and so on might just get entirely bricked by one copy of Urza Saga so you can't take any of this for granted and I think the ideal mix even if you know you're facing off against a Lurus deck is uh cheap interaction, and then a bridge to doing something powerful that can take over the game itself. I, I think just playing a purely reactive game, unless you're a control deck that is ideally set up to do that, is just a losing proposition. That's fair. I, I put a lot more stock in the top of my deck if I can make the, de the game go any longer than a couple turns against Hammer, just because I feel like most decks that aren't true control decks just don't play enough interaction to be like, I have lands and all this interaction and then like I'm going to draw into what like I guess a bunch of lands but like if you're drawing into a bunch of lands off any hand like it's going to be bad. So I, I'm i willing to take a bit more of a risk there. Um, the hands that I have as questionable kind of across the board and I think are worth discussing as a sort of sort of broader topic are when you're playing something like is it where you have a bunch of cantrips. Uh, are you okay with keeping the hands that are like all cantrips and interaction and no threat and being speculative or what, what kind of draws the line there? I, I have a tough time with this. I, I don't have the reps with is it or the, or the confidence in those, uh, to make a definitive claim there. My intuition is that those hands are fine in part because those cantrips are also enablers for your eventual threats. So if I keep this hand and I draw Dragon's Rage Channeler on turn one, for example, I want to be able to just start casting spells like cantrips uh, to be able to 
chase towards delirium and get that additional card selection from my channeler. Whereas if the rest of my hand is a bunch of unholy heats and counter spells, for example, those are going to be good as the game goes longer, but I might not be able to convert those immediately into support for my existing threat. Likewise for Motide Region, for example, um, my purely reactive hand might not be able to actually get that region out as fast as I want it to. Whereas if I can start firing off, you know, Serum Visions into Thor Scour or Consider, whatever it is, uh, that, then that gives me a powerful thing to do in the short term that I can work towards. Okay, that makes sense. I think that this may be... Framing this as is it may have been the wrong framing because is it has eight threats there. Um, I think that this might be a place you can get into trouble with the Luris Raghavan decks where you keep a hand that's like heavy on Mishra's Bobble in interaction because Mr. Bobble, Mishra's Bobble is just like a weaker cantrip. Um, but also those decks have less uh, threats that age well into the late game. If you're drawing like a Renin Six late, it's not great. If you're drawing what whatever cards the Rakdos deck plays, I don't I don't even know like what threats they actually have because their creatures are just so interchangeable garbage. But like drawing those late is pretty unexciting. So maybe that's the issue uh, with these hands is that is it can do it, but maybe no one else. Yeah, and that uh, level of uncertainty baked into your mulligan decisions is something that's worth considering when evaluating a deck and the the merits or uh, or lack thereof of picking it up. And, and it's something that would keep me away from uh, the specifically these uh, interactive Lurus decks, for example, where, um, yeah, those, those exact hands. I, I was planning to play John Saga this weekend and uh, played a prelim, played some leagues to, uh, to kind of get some, some reps in there. And I would so often have these hands of like Thorsey's Unholy Heat, uh, Two Lands, Mistress Bauble, and, you know, some other card whose application was unclear. And like this seems like a good bread and butter John hand, right? But like, is that capable? Is this even good? Is it better than the average hand with this deck? Uh, and that's the kind of thing you really need to have a good sense of if you're going to uh, pick up a deck like that. Yeah, and I think that kind of specifically the John deck because of the presence of Luris, I think you have to answer the question about whether your companion is counting as a piece of doing something proactive. And my general opinion has been that it very rarely is in any deck. It's kind of the way companion works now is sometimes the game just like creates a point where you just pick it up and then it's like, oh, look, a free card. And like it does dominate the game in those spots. But I never start a game assuming my companion is going to apply relevant pressure. It just like eventually becomes a thing. Yeah, this is actually where I think the the Yorion decks have a leg up over their uh, slimmer counterparts, where Yorion, I think, more reliably represents at least a relevant threat plus a relevant card than any other companion, including Lurus, um, unless you have the full support to set Lurus up. Um, and so with the Yorion build of Blue-Eye Control, for example, I would feel a lot more comfortable going down to six cards and then uh, having to break the emergency glass and uh, pitch cast a solitude in the mid game, uh, losing cards on the exchange, knowing that at some point I will pick up Yorion and cast Yorion and that will help me claw back some of those cards that I've lost. Yeah. It sounds like we're starting to get into some more deck specific things. So do you want to take a quick break and then when we come back, start getting really specific? Yeah, let's do it. What's up everybody, Cedric Phillips here, stopping by real quick to let you know about one of Star City Games' newest podcast, The Receivables, hosted by yours truly, alongside my partner in crime, of course, Patrick Sullivan, where the two of us discuss magic sets, both past and present, from top to bottom. On every episode of The Receivables, you're gonna hear us talk about the facts of a set, the mechanics of a set, the cycles of a set, you know, the boring stuff, before we get into some crazy stories of when we were playing magic during the times that the set was legal. Uh, we've got a ridiculous award show where we give out awards like the Char Rumbler Award for weirdest card in a set, the Oko Thief of Crowns Award for best card in the set, and a whole bunch more. Before we finally decide, hey, what card won the set and what letter grade should we give the set? It's a whole lot of fun. We're having a blast recording them. Hopefully you have the opportunity to listen to it and you enjoy it as much as we're enjoying recording them. Where can you find it? StarCityGames.com or wherever else you listen to your podcast. The Receivables every single week here at SCG. 
Okay, uh, so a lot of this discussion has been centered in the, the app track so far. Let's get into some of these specific decks because uh, we can have these uh, theoretical principles about how to handle these decisions, but often, especially with some of the more unique decks in modern, you pick them up and no, no principle that's general enough to be useful will actually help you with those uh, decisions. So it's worth uh, getting into the nuts and bolts there. Yeah, so I guess... Maybe let's just like quickly run down. We had the tier list from last week. Let's start at the top. And if something stands out in the uniqueness there, we should mention it. And I think the the most relevant place to start, because there's two decks that are doing the same thing that are sitting right at the top, and that's the Cascade decks. Um, and you have Living End and Team or Crash Gate. Yeah, so Living End uh, presents this, this weird problem here where you have eight payoff cards and you need to cast one of your Cascade spells into a Living End basically every game in order to get anything done. But because you have so many cyclers and those have this Mishra's Bobble issue of they are an unknown quantity, but they don't give you enough constellation by themselves with the partial exception of Wake of Waves, I guess, that you can rely on those actually finding you what you need, that sometimes you'll open up a hand of, you know, functional mana and a bunch of cyclers and maybe one piece of good interaction and it's so hard to know, is this a hand that will actually do anything in this game, or will I spin my tires, not find my 8 outer eventually, and just die because I haven't done it? My general rule with Living End has been, there's like three pieces of going off, right? There's the Cyclers, there's the Lands, and then there's the actual Cascade spell. And if I have any two of those three, the hand is going to work. Like, in, I think the Cascades and Lands, like, you probably need more than just one, but, you know... If it looks like I'm pretty set on two of those three and I'm just looking to draw the third, the hand's pretty obviously a keep. Uh, it is better if you are trying to draw the lands out of that equation, just because like the cascade cards draw you the lands and the least common piece in your deck is the, uh, sorry, the cyclers draw you the lands. The least common piece is the cascade spell and the most common piece is probably the lands. So you kind of, you're just like, using the best pieces and the best way to get there. So I'm more likely to keep like a one lander with this deck, but like you just have to accept some amount of fail rate when that happens, I think. Um, when you are missing, the the most common way to be missing multiple pieces is if you are looking at a hand that is a bunch of cascade spell or a bunch of cycling spells, no cascade spell, maybe short a land or two. Those hands uh, are dicey unless it looks like your interaction is good. Like if there is gr a grief or two in your hand and you're going to like shred your opponent's hand and give yourself some time to get there uh, or like be set up against some kind of hate card, I'm pretty happy to keep those. But that's when it starts getting dicier. Yeah, and this is a question which I think presents itself with uh, any of the Cascade decks or either of the ones that we'll discuss here is under what circumstances are you sending back a hand that has functional mana and a cascade spell? Uh, it's tough to imagine a hand that that would be a mulligan. I think you would have to have actual zero cycling spells or no greed. Like, you have to have nothing that's happening in the living end deck. Uh, in the Team Earn Crash Gate deck, I, I don't know what, like, are we talking a hand that's like literally six lands and a shardless agent? Because I think that's about the point where I'd have to be like, maybe on the draw in specific matchups, I would not want to keep like two shardless agents and five lands. But like, it's a hard ask if you're just like, well, you're going to play a cascade spell and make 10 power. Like most of those hands are just totally fine. Yeah, I think the uh, the example that would come up most often with either deck is when specifically you're on the draw and your opponent is either very fast or they're doing something which just the core conceit of uh 10 power of rhinos or wrath your board bring back 10 power myself that alone cannot be trusted to get the job done um so the example might be against uh this uh like let's say belcher as an example right where you have a hand which is it's a few cyclers and then a cascade spell but no interaction and you're on the draw and you could very easily just die on or before turn three for example or with Rhinos, it's, uh, you know, you're making 10 power, maybe you're making 8 power then again the following turn, but you're not meaningfully interacting against, uh, like, Hammer Time, for example. Yeah, the Hammer Time matchup is a very good example of a, a matchup where you don't want to be going down that road. It's tough because, like, 
when your opponent reveals a Lurus game one, I think if you have that like five land two cascade spell hand, you're kind of just like, well, if they're, you know, hammer time, I'm dead. And if they're any black red base deck, I'm just like off to the races, making a bunch of power and I'm fine with it. Um, but once you know what's up, you probably need to interact against hammer time. Um, one thing to note is that with teamer, so with living and I laid out this rule of having two of three. With Teamer, I don't really keep seven card hands that don't have a Cascade card unless I specifically know the matchup and I have the right interaction for it. Or in theory, I think if you have like a perfect suite of interaction and then like a manual on the play suspend footfalls, maybe you can keep that. But like it really has to be like a feel good hand where you're like, yes, I am a control deck suspending my win condition on turn one. Yeah, I think those suspend footfall hands to some extent are priced into the Rhino deck being as good as it is because fundamentally, when you only have eight enablers and you don't have that much card selection to get towards those, like you, you don't have what the Living End deck has of a bunch of cyclers and, you know, if you're seeing five extra cards in the game, that gives you another layer of consistency. With the Rhino deck, by and large, you're kind of using uh, what you have. I don't think that eight enablers, especially in the face of common disruption, is really enough to justify that, especially when that doesn't win you the game reliably. It's just making you a bunch of power, and who knows if that's going to be good enough, especially if it's not on turn three. If, if you're having to wait to find the Cascade spell, then there's a big difference between uh, 10 power on turn three and maybe eight power on turn five if, you, if it's violent outburst. Um, so I think those manual footfalls hands have to be part of that to some degree, but I think those are the ones that throw out the most issues of, you know, you, you have the eventual footfalls coming off to spend on turn five. Maybe you've got like a, a dead gone and a force negation or something. And it, it feels mopey, but maybe it's just enough to get across the line. I, I think those are the hands that uh, present the most uh, uh, dilemmas. Yeah, usually I'm looking for like a bone crusher giant or some like middling continuance play. The reason is, is that when your deck contains cards that are just like three mana make to eight to ten power the first mulligan is just so irrelevant it's just so free to just like yeah this hand is not doing enough i'm just gonna go to six cards and it'll work itself out uh it's not like most sixes are distinctly worse than like the bad interaction plus a turn one cascade i think you specifically need a a good piece of interaction like actually to be playing the game back and forth up to that point that that card is going to unsuspend and then that's when you do that, uh, when you side, when you keep those hands. Um, the only thing I'll caution is that I've gotten burned in the post board games uh, just because the turn one suspend, the green card starts becoming relevant for like endurance or force of vigor. But that's like a pretty marginal concern. Yeah, I, I wonder if the hidden A plus B here with the with the uh, the Rhino sec is just having lands to cast your cascade spell because I, I ran into some issues with this deck where your land count isn't that high and cannot really be that much higher, I think. Um, and yet you don't really do anything unless you get to three and start cascading. And so in that sense, it's not really a one card combo. Uh, it's, it's much easier than the, uh, you know, when people used to say scape shift is a one card combo, when in reality you had to have this uh, just raw quantity of resources to enable that. That's not quite the case here, but I think it does start becoming an issue either when, let's say, you go to six and you have uh, some land and uh, a cascade spell, but you're also needing to pitch something to a force negation or a fury or something and then uh, remove uh, a, a creature here and you quickly just run out of actual cards. Um, and then in terms of mulliganing, when, let's say, you have like a good one lander with a cascade spell on the draw, I, it, does it feel like one of those limited games where it's like, a good two lander and you have to keep knowing that some amount of the time you're just going to brick and die i don't like the one landers unless i'm like on the draw with a fire ice to kind of chain my way up but i you know if it's two lands like whatever sometimes every deck keeps two lands and never draws a third and dies like that's just life uh but one i I have learned my lesson about keeping those with this deck and i would try to avoid <laughs> it as much as possible unless again it's it's got to be something like you have the fury for a very specific, like you have to have the exact thing. Like you've got to have like 
a real dedicated reason that you think having this one land hand in this matchup is going to be okay. And that, that's a hard ask. Um, yeah, I, that, I think you are just signing up for some amount of that inherently when you play the deck. You know, that, that is part of the experience that you've uh, committed yourself to. With Living End, um, there's more hate that overlaps against that deck in some meaningful way. So in post sideboard games, uh, depending on how much interaction you, you've brought in, of course, how much less likely are you to keep a hand which is, you know, Cascade Spell, two lands, and some cyclers, but no, has no countermeasure against the hate which you strongly suspect your opponent is bringing in? Um, I don't feel too bad about that, uh, partly because I think that I would be willing to stray away from Living End if I feel like the hate is that dense, but also just because the cycling spells kind of help you make up the difference between, like, my opening hand doesn't have it, but I've got like six draws to find a foundation breaker and it'll be fine. Um, so that's kind of where I sit on that. I don't really love the idea of running living end into metagames that are harsh enough where I can't afford that margin. But uh, the deck is pretty good at providing depth of card scene to get to one of those things. Yeah, there is a kind of a individual unknown information issue there too, where Maybe you you correctly read the metagame at large as not being overly prepared or maybe even prepared enough for a deck like Living End, but this specific opponent maybe decided today they really don't want to lose to, it might not even be your deck, it might just be Graveyard decks. And so they have more copies of Rest in Peace, for example, than uh, the metagame dictates that maybe they should. Um, and so, you know, let's say you win game one and then game two, you see Rest in Peace and then you have to kind of make some Bayesian estimation of, well, all right, so it seemed like they had a lot of hate there, but is that just they drew most of the hate pieces or do they have enough hate that this is about what you'd expect in terms of how much they would find? And that is where going into that game three after that, it, it can become a bit muddled sometimes. Yeah, I've just kind of not deviated from very stock sideboarding with Living End. Uh, just I don't, I try to avoid those mind games and just assume that like there's some baked in, you know, not necessarily fail rate, but like, you know, your opponent's going to you have to accept the hate at some point with a deck like this. You're not dredge, but like stuff's going to happen. Your deck's pretty good at fighting its way out of it. Thanks to grief and force negation on top of everything else. But like sometimes you're going to get got um, moving on to another linear deck. I want to bring up Hammer Time as one of the decks that kind of ascribes to the old modern uh, style of mulliganing. Uh, it's a deck that notably just doesn't play interaction in any kind of real way. And it has like a very specific set of hands that do something and then a lot of hands that don't. So I have found myself mulliganing to like five cards or four cards with Hammer Time more than I think with any other deck that is not Tron. Yeah, that tracks with uh, my experience playing against competent Hammer Time partners. And I think that when you have this low resource nard draw that you can work towards which just doesn't need a, a high number of cards to do it, its thing and then also you have the the, the potential of Lurus in longer games to undo some of that uh, card disadvantage and then Urza Saga which there have been a lot of games where I've seen players you know, go down to five cards chasing that ideal draw miss uh, the entire way but because they have a functional five card hand backed up with Urza Saga that one card producing two big threats and then finding a third card uh, on, on the back end, like that effectively undoes the mannequin by itself. Like that is uh, two additional very good cards in that context. Yeah, I, I am willing to keep good Ursa Saga draws on seven and six for sure. I don't, I think that is the thing that you are supposed to keep that is not a, you know, the hammer is going on the creature hand, but like, I think that's about it. I can't imagine a, like, if you took all the Urza Saga, Sigarda's Aids, and Pure Steel Paladins out of the deck, I would start every game at like three cards and wonder what was going wrong with my day. I, I can't imagine hands I'd be keeping that don't do that. Yeah, I think that changes a little bit when you have high impact cyborg cards in the mix. So let's say uh, it's a matchup where Sanctify and Rebecca's good, and you're bringing that card in, and you have a hand which doesn't have the A plus B aid into hammer draws, maybe doesn't have Saga. It's just a bunch of like mopey stuff that also has a sanctifier. Like are, are those hands uh, getting across the line for you? 
Uh, I think if it was like the mopey stuff can't be like Memnite Ornithopter, it has to be like Esper Sentinel Ingenious Smith, but maybe. The, the problem is, is that this deck, like its Stoneforge Mystics aren't even good. So like there's not a lot of cards that are even the tier down of functionality and like they aren't even that good. So I, I'm willing to keep hands that are like, you know, if you play Giver of Runes, like those plus a hate creature or whatever, but uh, it has to be like a really effective one. Like Sanctifier does that. There are matchups where Hushbringer or Dranath Magistrate is the card that does that. But uh, in large, that's like only a marginal change to what the original plan is. And, th- and part of that is just because the original Hammer plan is the most powerful thing in the format. And it is better than a hate card or as good as a hate card in a lot of spots. That, that makes sense. Uh, so going down now to our, our, B, our B tier from what we discussed uh, last week, uh, I think Burn is an interesting deck to talk about in this context because it, more so than maybe any other deck, cares about just card quantity because you're trying to count to 20 and your cards do that in increments of three or for exactly one card, uh, four damage. Uh, and so you just need enough of those cards to get to that threshold. and then. The, the one uh, class of wildcards there is the creatures, right? Where you might be able to go to six, go to five with a draw that has one or more copies of Goblin Guide, Monastery Swiss Bear, for example. And there is a damage multiplier on those that can uh, make up for uh, the, the fewer cards that you have there. And likewise with uh, Eidolon and the Great Rebel, where there are matchups where that card is either just game winning by itself or is going to amount to four, six, or even more damage uh, a lot of the time. So what are your uh, heuristics in the dark here uh, against an unknown opponent uh, weighing up these burn hands? So the basic is that uh, as soon as a hand has... So, okay, so like the the tiers of burn hand, like there's the obvious, like it has two lands and five spells. That's pretty good unless like if you are on the draw in a spot where like the hand might be heavy on two drops, then I start questioning it. Um, I think you're supposed to keep a lot of the like no creature two land hands on the draw. On the play, they tend to be fine, but like like you said, that damage multiplier, it it pays out in rate and or like the rate you kill your opponent. And it starts getting dicey if you're like lava spike you on turn one on the draw in a lot of matchups. I think that's like an easy way to lose with burn. Um creatures, on the other hand, if my hand has multiple creatures, it's if I have like multiple guides or Swiss spears, I don't really know what would have to happen for me to mulligan. It would have to be like five lands with like with five lands, two goblin guides probably isn't good enough. But like that was my line for one landers was like if I have two creatures, it's fine, uh, especially on the play. Uh, four land is a, like a little sketchy. Basically, like don't keep hands with a lot of lands. Question your hands that don't have creatures, but like if it's got like a creature and like three lands and like any combination of spells, like don't worry about it. I unless like, you know, your searing blazes are dead because your opponent revealed. I don't, well, there's right. not, it, so yeah, <laughs> like all of the Luris decks basically have creatures. Uh, the Kahira decks are either, I guess. Creatureless control, where all right, you you take the L on that one, or as elementals, where Searing Blaze is probably your most important card. Um, and then even the Yorion decks these days, they are putting Yorion in there in order to blink a bunch of Ice Fang Corrattles or Wall of Omens and Solitudes and so on. So it feels like eventually you can find a use for that Searing Blaze. It's just a question of does it need to be in a certain time frame where you're having to stack up damage before then. Yeah, maybe it's the multiple Searing Blazes versus Kahira so- like plan where I'm questioning a hand. But like, even the Azorius decks have Solitudes. You can fire off a Searing Blaze in response to the Evoke trigger. Uh, I think this is worth mentioning a quick point that like, there are one of the reasons that I have sent back seven card hands more in this format than others is like a pseudo mulligan. And where like you have a seven card hand, but the seventh card is like redundant in some fashion. And then the rest of the hand is not exciting. You may as well just take a six. Um, What like the most common way that happens is if you have like two copies of an expensive removal spell. 
So like here, that would be like Searing Blaze in a very specific matchup where it could be dead in multiples. That's dicey. Um, but I'm thinking of like Azorius Control if you have double uh, Supreme Verdict or maybe like the Crash Gate deck if you draw two Prismari Command. Something like that uh, is something to look out for because just like pretend that card isn't in your hand and look at your other six that you would keep. Is that a good enough six that you'd be like happy with it? Or would you rather just take the effective free mulligan to a new six cards where you bottom one? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that is important as soon as your deck starts getting mid rangey at all. So like, oh yeah, the blink decks, perfect example. All these like Yorian decks, this is something you should be thinking about all the time. Yeah, and this, uh, I think for a deck which doesn't have a clear proactive plan and is needing to line up its threats and its answers in the right way, that may be where knowing what a companion means comes into that a little bit more. So for example, um, your Azorius control deck goes down to six, you have a spreading seas in your, uh, in your hand, knowing that, for example, spreading seas is very good against basically every Lurus deck and of marginal value against most other things, that might be enough to kind of move the needle in terms of uh, putting that back over one of these other conditional cards, which uh, has a different spread of what it's good against. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about these decks. I want to talk about a more proactive deck, going back to that whole tiering thing. Elementals. Uh, what is the keep range on Elementals? How much of it is like you need a Risen Reef or a Moldrifter? Like, what are your hands that you keep that aren't that? Is it just like Risen Reef, Moldrifter, or Ephemerate plus Incarnation? Like, are there Omnath hands that are keepable? It's a very strange deck, yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> Because you you kind of need a certain mass of resources initially to actually do anything, and you can avoid that with these uh, evoke ephemery draws. Where yeah, sometimes you both uh, you you kind of cast delirium skies uh, essentially, right? Both players are just tossing cards into the void, and when all is said and done, you have a solitude, you have a fury, or whatever it is, and that's enough to buy you the time to undo this predicament that you've engineered uh, for the both of you. Um, but then. Beyond that, you, you need to get to enough lands to cast Risen Reef, and then past that point, it's so valuable to be able to build towards hardcasting Fury, hardcasting Solitude, and having those stick around, um, that you do care about just, you know, a six-card hand versus an identical seven-card hand that also has an additional land in it. Like, that extra raw resource does make a difference. And so, given that, and then given also the fact that there are severe diminishing returns on having several uh, evoke creatures, um, especially if you think you're going to need to cast uh, several of them, you, you do care about card count. So that does lead you into keeping some like quite mopey seven card hands, which if maybe you're meant to just go down to six, but it is so easy to end up just mulliganing into oblivion and not really doing anything. Um, and again, I think this is why Drifter is kind of came into the deck and then became a centerpiece of the deck where just divination is actually the perfect solution to a lot of those problems um but yeah R risen reef by itself is a strong incentive to keep a hand if you know if my opponent reveals lurus for example and i think it's likely to mean hammer then solitude massively inflates in value i think those omnath hands do exist yeah if you just have let's say prismatic ending and then some elemental and a uh, fury or whatever and an omnath and three lands i'm keeping that most of the time because if I have time to cast on math, then that is going to do you know a little bit of everything uh, to uh, to get me along my way. Um, but yeah, I think elementals more so than most other decks. It is hard to nail down any good criteria, and that may speak to some structural flaw in the deck that's hard to articulate until you put it in those terms. Yeah, I I will note you mentioned the like double incarnation draws. If your incarnations match, then that's less of an issue because you just pitch one to the other and you're yes. not like burying yeah. yourself in inherent card disadvantage. But if they're split between like a fury and a solitude, that's when that comes up. Um, I'll also mention that the like inverse of this. So I had mentioned the pseudo mole thing. Depending on which planeswalkers you're running in this deck or the other four color decks, that's another spot that you can really get into trouble is when you draw two copies of either Teferi or Ren. Uh, especially Teferi, because that is a card that becomes, you know, if you have a seven card hand with two Teferis, unless you're like very specifically playing against Living End or Crash Gade, uh, you end up in a spot where like either the first Teferi is going to be very, very good 
or it's going to be so bad you don't want the second. And just like that's the time to question whether the like pseudo six card hand you have left over is actually a good six card hand. Mm -hmm. One uh, question I wanted to pose is regarding some of these cards which are so much better on the play than on the draw and how much that uh, biases your your range of keep in the dark. So Chalice of the Void is a perfect example here where against the Cascade decks, you'll happily take a Chalice at any point because that is literally free for you. But uh, against the decks where you want to be Chalicing on one, that is so much more effective a play when you're on the play than when you're on the draw. And so how much are you kind of uh, changing your evaluation of that card in the dark, just depending on, uh, on that dynamic? So when you say play draw, three cards immediately jump to mind. One, Chalice. So Chalice is a card where uh, I am often, when I'm trying to Chalice for one, I'm often just removing the card from my deck on the draw. Uh, if I have Chalice on the play, though, out of like Azorius control, that's like a, if the hand, the other six cards are reasonable, that's like a pretty good reason just to keep the hand and move along because you'll just, the free win equity is just there. On the draw, like then I'll start questioning it. But on the play, yeah, that's like a pretty chalice on the play in the dark versus chalice on the draw is like a pretty polarizing thing. Uh, the second card that is extremely play draw dependent is Ren and Six. But that card, I don't think it changes the keepability of a hand a ton because it just has this other function of like adding counters. Just I feel a lot more cozy with a hand if I'm running sixing on the play when my opponent has Luris as opposed to on the draw. It's very specifically, I should say, when I have Ren and six and my opponent has Luris revealed and I'm on the play with Ren, I'm going to get some kind of pickoff value against Asper Sentinel, Raghavan, De uh, Dragon's Rage Channeler, right? So that's like something where like if I'm on the play and I have Ren and six, like that's the kind of thing where like those double Ren and Six hands on the draw, like if my seven is double Ren and Six, I'm gonna have to ask a lot of the rest of my cards. If I'm on the play and I have double Ren and Six, I don't really care, like that's great. Um, and then the other is Raghavan, which I think you're just kind of priced into like, yeah, it's way better on the play, but like on the draw, you just play it and force them to deal with it and then move on with your life. Uh, and if they have some kind of exploit, like I mentioned, Ren and Six, and you're gonna be on the draw for a game, just take it out of your deck. But game one, I, I think it's just, with imperfect deck information, it's just too tough to make the call and you just kind of assume that your Raghavan's going to get somewhere at some point in time. How much value do you tend to place on the second copy of Raghavan? Because it is such a lightning rod for removal uh, that it, it's going to die on sight, basically. The first copy is if they have uh, any way to remove it. And so in those contexts, having the second copy to demand the second answer, and if they don't have it, then the Raghavan can start creating this continuous advantage over time that can get you out of some otherwise uh, uh, mopey draws. Conversely, though, if they have something which blanks the first Ragavan in a way that would also blank the second one, then you've taken a draw that is already, you know, effectively one card behind. Maybe it's also an actual card behind if this is a mulligan to six and you're having to decide what to put back. And now the second copy of Ragavan is really uh, sinking up the joint as well. Yeah, I, I don't really consider that. My opponents haven't been big on the like Lutter zombie style economy of like having a three toughness creature early these days. Um, I just I don't consider two Raghavans a bad thing for an opening hand. It's just going to be there. If Raghavan lives, they they die. If Raghavan doesn't live, I have the backup Raghavan. It's the card's just really good. And unlike some of the other cards I mentioned, uh, the fact that it's in your opening hand is just such a magnifier on the card's power. Whereas with like Teferi, like, you know, it's going to be turn three with Raghavan. It's just like it's turn one. It's there. It's turn two again. You have to kill it again. Uh, I I don't see any difference once I have double Raghavan in my hand. It's just like, oh, good. This is a Raghavan hand. Uh, this is another card that's going to be functional in it. That's great. Mm -hmm. Are there any other uh, specific decks or uh, specific cards that you think are worth uh, touching on uh, in the segment for the time being? Uh, let's see. So we covered all of our top tier decks. We talked about is it Murktide a bit, you know, earlier on. We talked about the, ca the Cascade decks, Hammer, Zorius Control. We talked about Burn. We talked about Elementals. We talked a bit about Jund. I think that that is another deck that's prone to these kind of like pseudo mulligan hands just because like 
not only does it have this issue with uh, Ren and Six doubling up or maybe even, uh, and, you know, we mentioned Ragnarok, but not really. But like it has issues with like all the cards are cheap, but it's playing a lot of lands so it can pseudo mulligan and have like, oh, yeah, I drew a four land hand, but that's not going to get me anywhere. Um, I think that about covers the top, top tier of everything. We even touched on some of the linear decks. Are there any decks that you want to bring up uh, in this mix? So I think Tron is worth mentioning uh, as the perfect bookend for this discussion because it is also effectively the deck that opened this discussion where the London Monaghan ushered in these immediate fears that Tron would take over the format, which I think it legitimately did become a lot better. And you saw that play out in the results of the uh, the subsequent modern Pro Tours there. I, I weirdly think in the current state of modern that has almost regressed a little bit. and that is specifically because of Prismatic Ending, where a lot of these uh, five-card turn three Tron hands, which are very dependent on turn one Expedition Map or turn one Chromatic Star into turn two Sylvan Scrying or, or sequences like that, are just that much less reliable now against the card Prismatic Ending. And against the decks that have those cards, uh, usually you can afford to wait the additional turn for a slower but safer you know, turn four uh, payoff instead of turn three. Um, and so I think that changes how aggressively you need to mulligan. And that can change, for example, if let's say you're on the on the draw against the Lurus deck, right? Um, where there's some chances hammer and you you need the fastest hand possible at all costs, or um, you know, but conversely, that could also be a black based Lurus deck where going to five and getting your Sylvan Scrying Thorsies is the easiest way to to lose a, an otherwise winnable game. Um, so I think Tron is a deck for which that discussion is still very relevant, but the exact specifics kind of vary quite wildly depending on um, the, the matchup in question. That's super interesting because I've still been operating under the old Tron heuristic of like, isn't Tron throw it back? But I also haven't liked Tron enough to really dig deeper into that. So that is a, a good discussion that I, I'm happy that has been brought up. So maybe you can open your Tron keeps a little more. Um, Maybe just touch on Amulet briefly, because I know, like you said, we said you played that deck recently. So how have you felt about the Amulet openers? So that there's a very niche case here, which uh, I played two Amulet Mirrors this weekend, which that's just what happens around these parts. This is not a niche question if you, <laughs> if you live in uh, this neck of the woods. Uh, but that is a really interesting example, because with Amulet, you have a lot of these... Um, slow but resilient titan hands where you're getting there on turn four and um you know you, you can find a way to do something relevant in the meantime in the mirror where speed is basically all that matters in game one those hands are very borderline on the play and unkeepable on the draw so immediately a, a stark play versus draw difference there and then in post cyborg games it or well even in pre cyborg games it creates this arms race where especially if you are on the draw you feel the need to mulligan to as fast a hand as possible ideally amulet itself leading to a turn three titan but if both players are trying to escalate their arms race and you're both going so far down in cards it's quite likely that at least one of those players is going to have to keep a either non-functional or quite slow hand and at that point your otherwise too slow turn four titan is probably going to be good enough actually and you, you kind of wish you had that seven back um and then in post cyborg games, where both players have access to Force of Vigor, which uh, lines up so well against all of the components of your fastest possible draw. So Amulet, Urza Saga, Dryad. Um, you want to have, ideally you want Force of Vigor yourself. You need cards to pitch to it. So that is a cap on how far down you can really go. And then the card Amulet itself gets you out of these low resource hands where one amulet lets the same bounce land convert into this giant stack of mana uh, with these uh, extra land drop effects. But without that, you actually do care so much about just having additional land drops to make because if you're on five cards, a card like Arboreal Grazer just is not impressive, right? Even if you have a bounce land maybe to put in uh, with it. And so that kind of extends more broadly to if you think the card amulet is especially vulnerable and you have the same prismatic ending factor that you have with Expedition Map in the Trondex now, um, then it's not a given that you just 
snap keep any amulet hand and just run that out on turn one anymore. You have to be a lot more judicious with uh, how you plan around that. Okay, and there you go. Everything you did or did not need to know about Mulligans <laughs> with Amulet Titan. Uh, are we qualifying that as nonsense of the week, or do we want to move into that segment and talk about some actual decks? Yeah, let, let's move into some actual nonsense uh, after a short break. With this break, I'd like to talk to you about Star City Games Premium. For years, StarCityGames.com has been hosting the best Magic the Gathering strategy content on the internet, and Star City Games Premium is a huge part of that. If you want to see great articles from Pro Tour champions, world champions, and many other accomplished players as that content comes hot off the presses, subscribe to StarCityGames.com Premium. More than that, Star City Games Premium comes with a host of benefits when shopping at StarCityGames.com. Premium members save 5% on Magic the Gathering Skill product, 10% on singles, and 15% on supplies. There's even special benefits on SCG Tour Online event entries to keep an eye out for when those events come around. All that savings and all that content costs just $7.99 a month. For the price of two booster packs, you can be on the cutting edge of Magic the Gathering strategy, getting insights from the best in the industry on Star City Games Premium. Okay, and let's round it out here, as we always do with uh, some nonsense of the week. And you have been uh, going through the files here to find some good, some good nonsense to serve up to the crowd. So I'll, I'll hand you uh, the microphone here. Okay, so I've got this Teamer Crashgate deck. Uh, maybe you've heard of it. Okay. Except what? Except <laughs> uh, this is uh, three crashing footfalls. Okay, four territorial Kavu, four Scion of Draco. Maybe this isn't quite Teamer, but all the spells are Teamer. Weird. Uh, we've got the typical Fury season Pyromancer stuff going on. Shardless Agent, Bloodbraid Elf, Red and Six, and then we've got Incongruity. Incubation and Carnival Carnage. Uh, you may recognize these as the split cards from Ravnica Allegiance that have multiple card types. Uh, so they're one of them is like Rakdos mana to deal one and one. So like one to a creature and one to its controller. Uh, and then like it's got a blightning mode. And then the incongruity is like green to look at your top five for a creature or, or sorry, Simic, or then it's like a sort of beast within instant. And all of this adds up to Bloodbraid Marauder in the two drop slot. So what this really is, is the mashup of Domain Zoo and Teamer Crashgate. Yeah, there are there certainly are some incongruities in this deck. That, that is a, a, a true statement for sure. So you would not think normally that you would want a two drop in your uh, very focused Cascade deck where... Uh, it is illegal to play anything that costs less than three, unless it technically does not cost uh, less than three. Um, this deck, we have Cascade spells kind of going all the way up the curve. So we have the cheapest possible one in Blood Moon Order. We have Charlotte's Agent in the three drop slot. No Violent Albus here, uh, for the record. And then we have uh, two copies of Blood Raid Elf. And so it, you have this uh, actual variance in what you can hit with your Cascade spells, where you cast a Charlotte's Agent. Maybe you hit Crashing Footfalls. Maybe you hit Red and Six, uh, which... I guess that's a fine value play, but maybe not what you were expecting or hoping for. Uh, maybe you hit Territorial Carvu, which is kind of like a Rhino, right? If you look at it at a certain uh, angle. And then sometimes you hit Blood Moon Order, which if you have Delirium, then that's the RC because you also get a Foot Force on top of that. And so you've made 13 power <laughs> instead of 10. However, if you don't have Delirium, well, suddenly this is the, this is the Joker, which if you hit this, then... Uh, Okay, great. You've made five power for three mana, which eh, maybe in some five set of standard formats that would be acceptable, but it, it sure isn't here. So it, you actually have a range of outcomes, which is not what you're hoping for when you're building a deck. Uh, but in terms of making the deck more interesting, it, it certainly accomplishes that. Yeah, I think that qualifies it as solid nonsense. Um, it's, moving uh, along, we I, have... I, I, I will say it's sad that, you know, if you think back to some of the the week one cascade deck that had sign of draco right because in theory this is the perfect backup plan you just play this on turn two and uh, that's going to apply a lot of pressure demand a removal spell um and so this is the perfect backup that conveniently cost 12 instead of two uh for when you don't have a cascade spell and it turned out that sign of draco just doesn't really live and when it does live it isn't very good which is weird because it's a two mana four four flyer with a bunch of other upside but that's that's where the format has moved to at this point, and that's uh, just the, the world we live in. 
Are you saying they should have printed the original version that was an 8-8? Uh, maybe if Unholy Heat dealt 8 instead. Maybe that would uh, balance it out properly. Yeah, uh, let's not think about that. And let's move on to this next deck, which is uh, Luris Ether Vial. Uh, this is Mono White Humans Luris. Uh, I have actually played against this deck, and I lost to it. I am trying to remember what I was playing at the time, but for a deck that is like, it feels like it's like operating in the ballpark of Hammer, which is kind of interesting, but at the same time, like, it's actually a good Urza Saga deck, which is maybe you want this if you are afraid of like Force of Vigor uh, messing up your Hammer deck. And in the meantime, you're like either violing out one and two drops, which is kind of weird. But when one of those two drops is Intrepid Adversary, that's kind of nice. So that is the Mythic Rare from Innistrad Midnight Hunt, the uh, one in a white, three one lifelink human with an enters the battlefield trigger of paying one and white to put counters on it uh, that give each creature you control plus one plus one. Yes, uh, and notably this works with Lurus too because the adversary itself is a two drop, uh, which lets you keep Lurus as your companion and also recast the adversary with Lurus and then you still get the, uh, the, the kicker effect, uh, so to speak, when it comes back in there. So in a way, this deck reminds me more of Affinity, even where you have some of that uh, Saga-based resiliency, uh, but your main plan is just flopping a bunch of power onto the table and hoping that that's uh, good enough. And I, I don't know, I think this deck is good enough at that to to earn some attention. Uh, Aetherval is, is a fantastic card that pairs very well with Saga, right? Not just because it is a one-drop, which theoretically you can find uh, with the back end of Saga, but also just you have this thing which is casting your spells for you so you don't have to and frees up your mana to spend on Ether Vial and then those constructs in turn, because you have this, this cheap artifact already in play, those are going to be a little larger and Esper Sentinel contributing to that too, right? Um, so I kind of like a lot of what is going on here. How good of a card do you think uh, Thalia Guardian of Thraben is in the format at the moment? Um, well, it sounds like it's pretty good against the Cascade decks, right? They need five mana to go off instead of the normal three. So that's pretty good. Probably pretty good against Azorius Control. Yeah, I mean, it's four mana if it's Shardless, oh, Asian, Shardless. right? And right. then Rhinos is going to have a bunch of, like, Furies, which is just a nightmare for this deck. Prismari Commands, uh, Dead Gorns, that kind of thing. Um, so Thalia itself, yeah, it seems very fragile. And then against the, the Control decks... Prismatic Ending actually lines up very all, or no, it lines up very well against Thalia, excuse me. Thalia is awkward against Ending because what they can do is they can initiate casting Ending for X equals zero. Thalia ticks that up to X equals one, which if it was paid using a different color of mana than white, they now have a uh, converge for two, which will remove Thalia. So they can still effectively use their two drop to, to kill Thalia. That doesn't get taxed in quite the same way. Um, and then a lot of those decks have a bunch of Solitudes and Wall of Omens now even, so I don't quite know how reliable it is there. And then against the, the Ragavan DRC decks, it seems very hit or miss, where it could either be absolutely fantastic, you know, it's bricking their Ragavan and making it harder for them to turn on their DRC while bricking the DRC, stranding a bunch of cards in their hand, or it can just be very flimsy. They have a DRC flying over it already, they have Motide region just embarrassing your Thalia. It feels like it really could uh, go either way there. Yeah, I... You talk about this, and as soon as you say this, I'm like, this deck can never beat a Renin 6 ever. So that might be the bigger concern, more than any of the cards we've listed. Um, I do wonder if this deck wants to play some number of Springleaf Drums instead of Vials, like mix it up, because Drum is a better card for Urza Saga and, like, I think a little better than Vile sometimes when you're like setting up in those early turns, but I could be wrong on that. I Yeah, I kind of think that like you, you want your turn one champion to be attacking, right? You don't want it to be tapping to, to cast another spell or um, like you, you don't want to be tying up your creatures which are earmarked for some other purpose. And I think so much of Drum's use in the Hammer deck and in old school affinity before that relied on Memnite and Ornithopter for those fast stars. And you get those fast stars, but there is a real cost of putting those cards in your deck. And if you don't, I, I don't think you can avoid that sacrifice. I think without those cards, Drum just isn't jumping you up enough by enough. 
Okay, yeah, my thought was that, like, if you're tapping for an Aether Vial on turn one, if you're turn two with Drum, you're getting to the same point. I guess this deck doesn't have the ability to really use Drum to jump into the turn two Urza Saga activation, so maybe we can strike that. I think the, um, but, I think the one Drum as a Saga target makes a lot of sense, though. That's possibly fair. Uh, continuing along these lines of hyper-efficient decks, uh, this last deck, you know, it constricted itself to ones and twos. What if we just took that a step further, and what if we played Uno Red? Okay. Okay, so this is a mono red deck that 5 voted a league, and every card in the main deck is a basic mountain or costs one mana. There are four Bomat Couriers, four Dragon Ray Channeler, four Fanatical Firebrands, four Monastery Swiss Spears, three Wayward Guide Beasts, uh, four Forked Bolt, four Lava Spike, four Lightning Bolt, four Tar Fire, four Pyre Spell Bomb, and four Seal of Fire. Um, I assume this was a bit of a budget challenge, just looking at the price on Magic Online clocking in at 13 tickets. I assume you could add some Raghavans to this. I assume <laughs> you could splash Luris, but I just really enjoy the fact that this is an all one drop deck that is too busy being a one drop deck to play an Obosh. Yeah, I don't know how the, the Marmoset index works out for Raghavan versus literally every other card in this deck put together. Uh, you know, the... Your other uh, 71 cards gets you to, like, some tiny fraction of a Ragavan. Um, but I actually, I, I respect the choice of no Obosh, because th this person, uh, Demian Desposito 10, they're being realistic with themselves. They know, look, if I'm getting to 5 mana, and I'm taking a turn off earlier to spend 3 to, to pick it up, something has gone terribly, terribly wrong, and making my Bomat Courier hit for 2 instead of 1 probably isn't moving the needle. So I actually... I almost respect the, the self-awareness about the limitations of this strategy and just the, the devotion to being as bored to the wall as you can get here. Yeah, and to check your ratio, it is about seven copies of this deck to one Ragavan. Okay. So think about that. You could, have, you could have seven instances of Magic Online open at once playing this deck in a league for the price of one Ragavan. I mean, hey, if, if this deck is actually good, then if you have seven accounts open at once and you're just uh, uh, set two pool tabling leagues at the same time, you quickly earn enough tickets that maybe you can actually buy one single copy of Ragavan. Yeah, it would be... This deck probably racks up the wins or losses very fast. You then have the uh, the awkward debate over which of these accounts earns the privilege of putting the Ragavan in the deck, but uh, that, that, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Yeah, you know, you can you can roll a D7 or something along those lines. I'm sure that exists. Okay, so uh, <laughs> with that in mind, I I'm assuming... This is not what you would recommend necessarily if you had a, a tournament coming up. What would be your pick if you were uh, battling in the trenches uh, this coming weekend? If I was playing this upcoming weekend, uh, I think that the deck that I... I have three choices. I think that if you just said you were playing Hammer, it would be hard to disagree with you. And that's just like the best deck choice. If I was aiming for the event win, I would be playing Burn. I think that that deck is really good, really well positioned and under respected. If I was going for an overlap of how much I enjoy the deck and like uniqueness, just like being it's like this is the deck that I would show up with and get the most out of. That would be the Esper Reanimator deck. Um, I think the deck is, again, under respected, more powerful than people give it credit for. And I think it's just doing all the things I want to be doing. That, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, if if I wanted to feel something, I would probably just play Amulet again and hope to just uh, continue whatever mixture of luck and other factors uh, led me to success this weekend. I think if I was really focusing with uh, the tournament in mind, then I like the Yurion Blue Eye Control deck. I, I, I don't think Currivore's uh, sustained success with that deck and the 10 no one uh, in this, this recent challenge. I don't think those are coincidences. I, I think there's a reason that that, that stuff is happening. Uh, and I think that core is now at a point where it looks really well built to me. Uh, so just getting some reps in there, ironing out the last few slots, that uh, would be my priority. And then I see Yorkmoth doing well so often and I can't replicate it. I want to really drill down on the reason why. I, I want to I want to know how much of this is a me problem versus just the inconsistencies of the deck over a small sample size making themselves known kind of problem. Uh, and so if I had enough time to devote to that issue, and hopefully I will over this coming week, then I would want to nail that one down too. Because I think that deck 
And at this point, its results are getting hard to ignore, and so few people are playing it that uh, that it, that makes it even harder. Yeah, well, I think we mul- we both might be going down this uh, this Yawgmoth road this week. So hopefully, we will have an answer for you on the next episode of Dominaria's Judgment. Um, until then, you want to go down the usual spiel about where people can reach us to ask about their own pet decks and what we may or may not think about them in the weeks coming forward. Yeah, so uh, we we had our tier list episode uh, last weekend, which uh, we didn't receive much blowback for, but I think at first that was because the uh, the audio was mangled initially, so they couldn't hear the the vicious slurs that we were using against their preferred archetype. Luckily, that was fixed. Uh, we got that turned around pretty quick, so... Uh, if you do have any angry feedback on that or anything that we said this week, you can find me on Twitter uh, at Domin Javier. You can find Ari on Twitter at ARMLX. And we will be back here uh, next episode with more nonsense of the week and something else uh, to, to catch your attention to. Take care, everyone.